Okay. Okay, we're ready. So, yeah, everybody's here. Let me just remove the waiting room. Okay. Right, hi, everyone. Again, one more time. Um, I'm very excited about this and, um, you know, a Excited to hear you speak about the works that you've actually contributed to Indelible, whether it was prose, photography, art. Um, this is, I mean, it was all amazing. And this new issue is an incredible new issue because of all of you, because of your beautiful submissions and contributions to it. And I was amazed at how many folds and layers of the feminine we were able to unfold together in this issue and uh, how many there still are. I mean, the more we saw, the more we know that there is out there. So that's, that's absolutely amazing. And uh, again, thank you all for this. Um, so uh, as you know, uh, each one has seven minutes to present, but two presenters have um, just sent me emails now telling me that they can't make it. Um, so feel free to take up to 10 minutes if you feel the need to. Um, and um, other than that, any questions before we begin? I'm 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 not presenting. Okay. I'm I'm I'm, I'm just 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 <laughs> here to, to watch. Okay, Gottfried. Okay, great, great to have you with us. And uh, Gottfried, by the way, you did present some amazing photography and artwork. So again, if you feel like you would like to speak about this, go ahead. <sighs> I'm 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 not really good with screen sharing, so uh, I give it a okay. miss to the bit. Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. So we will start with Vinny. Hello, Vinny. I'm, I'm I just surprised. I thought we were going in the order that uh, it was listed. So, but huh. great, fabulous. Okay. So uh, I'm here on the west coast of California, where it's a bright and early uh, seven a.m or I guess eight now. And uh, first of all, uh, thank you uh, to Indelible for this absolutely gorgeous publication. I'm so honored to be in it and um, thrilled that it came out for International Women's Day. And of course, the whole month of March is Women in History Month. And, um, you know, I just think about my life and what's been possible for me. And I know that it's only because of the warrior women who came before me and the battles that they fought and that all of us women are standing on the shoulders of giants. And uh, for many of us, that includes our ancestors and for me, uh, definitely my mother. And the piece that I have in the publication, World Civilization, I submitted it as fiction, but it really stems very closely to facts from my mother's life. Uh, my mother raised 10 children and then overcame enormous obstacles to go on and um, go to college and uh, eventually have a master's degree and uh, have a career. So without further ado, I think I'll just spend my uh, seven minutes reading from World Civilization. <clears throat> Aberdeen's father-in-law was a mean son of a bitch. He ground his first wife, a mousy little woman, down to dust. And his second wife, Mitchell's mom, wore a rut in the linoleum between the stove and the head of the table. So when the man dropped dead in July of 1959, Aberdeen didn't care much, except that in hindsight, his death launched a quick succession of tragedies. On August 16th, a Sunday, she was frying up hamburgers at the parking cafe when a rancher from out near her folks place came in, took off his hat and told her her brother Richard and her father-in-law, his father-in-law had drowned while fishing. Aberdeen left the three patties sizzling she sank onto one of the stools at the counter. That's my brother, 
my only brother. Blood trickled from her nose. When she sniffed, she smelled burning hamburgers. Only four days later, her son Parker, the sixth of her 10 children, already a strange child, tried to stand on top of their horse. He was bucked off and knocked unconscious. He remained in a coma for three days and each morning Aberdeen's stomach clenched and her nostrils, gu nostrils gushed blood as though she were trying to rebirth Parker through her nose, which made no sense except that breathing was the first thing a person did. And the last, Aberdeen thought, as she pressed a rag against the flow of blood. In the end, a person experienced life and death in the same breath. Two days after Parker woke up, Aberdeen's childhood boyfriend, Dean, died from a heart attack at age 41. Aberdeen was hanging out the wash when she heard the news from someone who had seen the procession of cars. The wet sheet slid out of her hands into a bushel basket and she ran toward the cemetery without changing from her work pants. Mitchell's old t-shirt clung damply against her body. The cemetery rested adjacent to the pasture. The boxer dog Lulu followed her across the dry buffalo grass. Aberdeen thought sweetly of Dean, the notes and hand-holding, horse rides and innocent kisses. But as Aberdeen approached the circle of mourners and tidy black, embarrassment seized her. As she watched from a distance, her daughter Jazz and her friend Sandra hoisted themselves up out of the gravesite hole. While her younger children liked to climb on the nearby post piles, she could not fathom what these 14-year-old girls were doing here, much less why they were down in the hole. Aberdeen turned back. On the way home, the part of her embodied in Dean dripped out in a trickle of blood. No trace remained when she asked Jazz, what were you girls doing over in the cemetery? The girl's big blue eyes widened. There was a mouse. She fled from the kitchen. But 1959 was not done with Aberdeen. Mitchell came up with a scheme to raise chinchillas in the basement and also decided that their daughter Carmen's wedding reception should be at their home. She agreed to the first because Mitchell, when Mitchell fastened on a scheme, that was that. She agreed to the second because they couldn't afford anything else. Then everything changed. That fall, Black Hills Teachers College offered an extension course at Philip. Her daughter, Carmen, signed up to take world civilization and then set to work on Aberdeen to take the class too. Aberdeen gave in because Carmen had always been a child who didn't ask for much. But when she did, she would not stop pestering. Besides, when Aberdeen was young, she had enjoyed school. She was curious what it would be like now. On the first evening of class, they walked downtown together to Aberdeen's favorite building in Philip, the courthouse, a four-story block surrounded by mature elms. The interior was cool, even on a scorching summer day. Their footsteps on the marble floors echoed from the high ceilings. Aberdeen sniffed. The tang of blood ran down her throat, but she still caught the pleasant smell of musty books. Carmen closed the grillwork door, the elevator, and they rode to the fourth floor room. They joined seven other students, six women, one man, already seated in metal folding chairs around a U of tables. They all knew one another and nodded in greeting, but no one spoke as though this were a sacred or clandestine meeting. When the woman appeared in the doorway, 
they knew she was the professor, firstly, because she was a stranger, but also because no one in Philip looked that way. She wasn't beautiful or even trying to be. She wore tight black pants and a black sweater that called attention to her thinness. She didn't dye or perm her hair, but left it long and flecked with gray. It was twisted into a bundle at the nape of her neck. Her black shoes looked like bedroom slippers and slapped across the floor as she sashayed toward the front of the room, her sharp pelvic bones leading the way. She didn't look like she'd ever had a baby. The class stared as she loaded a slide projector. They gaped at the sudden rectangle of light on the wall. The tiny apparition of a woman spun around, took her place at the podium, put down a manila folder, Aberdeen set up straight. I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you, Hetty. I, um, Vinny, I greatly, greatly enjoyed reading this. I mean, usually it takes me some time to filter through the submissions, but I remember reading yours and then I was like, no, we're having this issue. <laughs> Uh, thank you. It's very powerful. And um, yes, I mean, I hope, I hope you all get a chance to read it at some point soon. Thank you so much. And yes, uh, you. next up is Hedy. Dr. Hanna isn't here yet. So Hedy, uh, I guess you can step in. Hey, thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. And I'm glad it worked out with the daily uh, saving uh, time change. <laughs> And um, I will be uh, <clears throat> presenting my short story uh, from um, my collection, Flying Carpets. And the short story is titled um, Nur el Kamar. Uh, the, the, the book is a collection of magic realistic stories that become more and more surreal. And Nur el Kamar uh, is uh, such a surreal story. It's the name of a protagonist a female protagonist from another realm who's revered as a goddess. The story is told from her point of view in an extended interior monologue, a sort of introspection and stream of consciousness. The character's plight are both her immortality and prodigious memory. She spends her time researching esoteric scrolls and sacred text, studies uh, mysticism and astrology in her quest to retrieve the secret of her origin. Many facets and archetypes of the feminine are exemplified throughout her life. The story is 10 pages long, but I'll be reading only uh, the introduction, uh, the beginning. Uh, uh, Nouril Kamar discovers art and falls in love with the sculptor that was commissioned to um, create her statue. She defies the odds and tries to escape her destiny, but to no avail. No one around her realizes her suffering in a life that might be seen as an eternal present. Yet she doesn't lose hope and awaits every 50 years for the propitious time when the right alignment of stars will enable her to reconnect with her origin. So I'll just read the, <clears throat> the beginning. I was discovered on a misty night by a drunken sailor, a bundle glowing by the prow on top of folded sails. Bewildered, the man stumbled over a thick glistening rope dangling out of nowhere. As he held the plated silk, it slipped from his hands and vanished almost instantly, but not before he glimpsed swirls of fire moving up and down a radiant ladder. He looked again at the light and dared not come closer. It's a piece of moon, he said, Noor, Noor, and retreated to the farthest end of the small fishing boat. For days and nights, I glowed in the hazy mist eliminating the dark rested waves over a great distance. Motionless, the man stared and stared 
until his barge landed safely upon these shores. It is recounted that he kept repeating Nur al-Qamar, Nur al-Qamar, which in his dialect, that of people from lands where Shams, the sun, begins his daily journey, means light of the moon. Then the sailor withdrew into profound silence and disappeared in the Jebel Mountains, or at least that is what I've been told. Of what became of me at that time, of what my life was like during that remote past, I only know from other people's accounts. This is how I retraced the first stages of my life in this world. For I only conceived precise memories from the day I used language to communicate. Before I kept alive a kaleidoscope of images and undefinable sensations. Some things I recall distinctly. I understood from the very beginning, I was expected to close my eyes at night and play dead at sunset the way others did. Later I learned this was called sleep, a normal activity necessary for humans, which I feigned in order to withdraw into myself, shielded from my surroundings. It enabled me to retreat and relive the events, images, and sounds of previous days. With time, I developed an infallible memory. I tried to discover the mysterious mechanisms of dreams, which were never allotted to me. Meditating on one shape, one thought, I only experienced haunting visions of clinging to a monumental breast and the pain of letting go. I'd see myself clutching at the gigantic curves enveloping me, my mouth gorged with soft warmth, then ruthlessly hurled into a cold void. In these days of my earthly experience, I was entrusted to the care of the highest ranked inhabitant in the region, a privilege inherited by their descendants. All considered me a daughter of the moon, though the radiance I first so strongly emitted had gradually faded. It nevertheless lasted innumerable years, causing people to believe I possessed supernatural powers. To this day, centuries later, whenever I remain in absolute darkness, an ethereal aura emanates from me. Since I reached maidenhood, I have scarcely changed. I was, and I am still to this day, fair and pale, not ivory pale, for ivory is hard, and my skin and flesh give the impression of being hollow and vacuous, as though formed by condensed mists. My long hair seems to be made of the same substance. Its swaying waves mold themselves to my body, as though my skin were a magnet. They called me Lena, among many other names of lesser importance. One day, tall men from distant lands came in search of Muna, a moon goddess they identified with me. To this day, the polemic around what should be my official name is still forceful. The high priests favor Lina, though most people call me Nur, since it was the first name ever given to me by the common folks, and it is my favorite. As many in the village, especially the elders, revered me as a goddess, I was forbidden to take a husband. My features were carved in wood and magical stones like moonstones. Small effigies were kept on altars in every household, continuously lit by oil lamps. <clears throat> the rivers I bathed in and the fields I walked through were considered miraculous. The inhabitants withdrew religiously when I approached a stream or a riverbank, allowing me a welcome privacy. I think I will stop at that because <clears throat> I think my throat is telling me it is time. Thank you very much for listening. Hedy, thank you so much. This was brilliant. There was so much radiance in it, uh, just like everything else that you write. Um, your poetry, your prose, your scholarship. And this is a great honor having you with us, Hedy, all the time. 
and your contributions are like the highlights of our issues and our sessions. And for those of you who don't know Hedy, um, Hedy is, um, is one of the top um, Arab American writers, according to ArabAmerica.com. She's one of the top 10 um, remarkable Arab American women writers. So Hedy, thank you for being with us as ever. And thank you for sharing this uh, wonderful piece of surrealism that has uh, the moon in it. So which uh, moves us now next to Rami. Rami Amun. Hi, Hello, uh, Rami. Hi, hi, Rami. Rami, hi. this is such a great honor and pleasure to meet you. Uh, you have no idea how long I hesitated before asking you to share some of your images with us. I mean, I'm a huge fan. I'm a moon child, actually. You know, I wait for the moon every night. And then in order to feel closer to the moon, I look at your photos and, and I feel that I am literally there. It's just absolutely amazing. And seeing that you have half a million followers, um, you know, you would think you know, he's not gonna answer, but I'm so thankful that you did. And I'm very happy that you're here with us today. And we'd like to hear more about your work. And if you would like to share your screen, please feel free to do so. All right. Uh, good morning or good evening, wherever uh, you are. Uh, I know some, it's the evening on uh, in some regions with uh, some people. And th thank you for inviting me. It's, it's an honor to be here and I appreciate your time. Um, can you see my slides? Yep, perfectly. Great. Um, all right, so uh, just uh, a little bit of a background about me. I am actually not a photographer. I am a dentist and I specialized in prosthodontics. Um, I'm a full-time uh, assistant professor in, in Virginia Commonwealth University. And uh, I do lunar photography uh, as a hobby. Um, I'll just brief you a little bit about uh, astrophotography. It's the photography of uh, celestial objects and its phenomena. I started doing this in 2015, and it's one of the extreme types of photography. It, it requires time, it requires money, expensive equipment, and, uh, and pa uh, patience. And uh, one of the biggest challenges um, in, in this hobby is that you are uh, taking pictures of, uh, of the stars and the objects. Uh, I apologize, the video is a little bit laggy because of Zoom, uh, but uh, just to give you an idea, just to give you an idea, you know, this is a time-lapse of the uh, lunar eclipse in, uh, in last November, and I'm not sure if it is laggy, and you know, again, I apologize for the quality of, of the transmission. But the stars and the moon uh, are always moving, and you know you have you have to get an, an equipment that tracks that tracks these objects as it goes. And um, you know, Earth is like a space shuttle; we're always moving. The Earth is rotating, and there there are things that are rotating around the Earth, which which makes it more challenging. Uh, so the uh, requirements to, to get into this hobby, you need a telescope or a lens, you need a camera, you need, you need, you need powerful uh, software and a powerful computer. You also need clear skies, you know, definitely you cannot do that with, with, with cloud in, uh, in place. And you also need skills. And this is something that, uh, you know, that you acquire with time. Uh, you also need knowledge about uh, what, uh, what your, uh, what you're doing as well. And uh, uh, there are challenges present as well. You know, not only you need skills, but there's also the social media presence. And uh, you have to have persistence. You have to post uh, periodically, you know, on, on a, you know, at least three to five times a week. Uh, you know, you have to post at specific times of the day. Usually in America, you have to post in the early morning because people start waking up and checking their social media. And, and that's when, when it's the most active time. You have to always give quality content because it's, it's very competitive. And you have to follow trends. For example, on Christmas, you, 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 I post 
stuff that is relevant to Christmas or Halloween or so forth. You know, I, I make my content relatable. The, uh, there are types of astrophotography. There is the lunar photography, which is the moon, which is what I do 90% of the time. There is solar. Uh, this is the only solar picture I got because I don't have solar, uh, good solar equipment. There is planetary. And uh, for planetary, you need, you need, a, you need a, a telescope that has a powerful range. And here are some planetary images that I took previously. There is the deep sky. Uh, you know, generally you have to go to a site that has low light pollution. Uh, currently the advancements, uh, there are the, the equipment advanced, uh, sorry, let me just, uh, there is some uh, advancement in the equipment that you can do that, you know, even when, when, the, light porch, uh, when the light porches are on. So you can do that uh, in your front yard too. And there is the wide angle photography uh, where you do the Milky Way and the large constellations. This is one of the pictures I took in California and Joshua Tree. This is Mars to the left, and this is the Milky Way, and this is me and to the right. Uh, you know, talking about relative content, uh, this was the Halloween moon I posted uh, last October for the occasion. So uh, that's how I relate. Uh, my content to, to the trends and occasions. And this is, this is something that you are always learning. Um, on my Instagram, there, are, there is about 490 posts, but I actually have more than 700 pictures taken. And with each picture, I keep learning. This is the pinwheel galaxy. I have not shared this picture yet, but you can see the noise and it's not of a good quality, but with processing, you can get something like this with the processing. I haven't shared that yet, but the, the concept is that you are always learning. You know, I have every, the 700, almost 700 pictures I took with each one, I learned something new. And this was the moon last night. It was very cold. It was minus uh, five degrees Celsius outside with, with the wind, but I still went outside and um, I still took a picture of the moon to share with you today. So that's all. Uh, thank you for your time. And I hope you, you learned something from, from my presentation. Thank you, Rami. This was incredible. And uh, follow Rami if you don't yet. I mean, this is, this is really some, some amazing work. And uh, what I really liked about it is the interdisciplinarity. I mean, you being a dentist and an astrophotographer who learns daily from what you do. So this is some real arts-based research that you do, that you conduct as a habit. And it's, um, I mean, it's just something to admire. So you must have a great passion for it, of course. Thank you, yes. You have, um, yeah, you should have passion for it because it can be painful to be outside in the night. You know, you have to spend hours on a computer, but, but it's very rewarding as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for being with us. And thank you for the photos, Rami. Um, and we look forward to seeing more, of course. Thank sure, you. Sure. Mm -hmm. My pleasure. And thank you so much. And next up, we have um, uh, Adam. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How are you doing? Wow, that was amazing. That photography. So, I mean, it's almost breathtaking to see the moon so huge like that. Um, I've been watching it rise the last however day, few days. We had a beautiful new moon, and um, it's kind of right south at the moment. Is it south or wherever? It's kind of well. Yeah, we see it in front of the house anyway. But um, yeah, that was really extraordinary stuff. I just followed you immediately Rami, on Instagram, which I'm very new to. I'm still learning my way. Thank um, Thank thanks, um, Rula Maria, for having me. I mean, this amazing issue. It really is. I mean, it was. Um, I only wrote this piece recently, um, as you know, and um, it seemed a bit serendipitous. In fact, I wouldn't normally send a piece which is kind of so new, which I only just really finished. Um, but seeing this issue of the feminine and this piece was very feminine and 
anima inspired you know which um as many of you know the anima being the union the, the the sort of the female soul within the man the female presence um archetype and all of that and um so i i recently in september i was i was invited to go on a uh poetry residency um along the camino in galicia which was which was amazing and um so uh it was we'd spent five days walking and then five days or a week um, at a retreat and then giving talks about our experience and reading poetry to schools and, and things. Um, and the Camino has always been something I've wanted to do for a long time, but I wasn't expecting it to be so um, intense and so um, transformative. And I, I'd literally just signed off on uh, a recent book of mine called About Blank, you know, sent it to the publishers and, you know, when you have something that's been in your head for a long time, you know, you think you, you know it. And it was it was very strange because lots of things, it's a weird thing doing the Camino because it's like you're just walking normally in many ways. It's an everyday kind of thing. And yet it's so not everyday. It's your, you can hear the world out there, but you really are in this other world. It's a very mythical experience. And... I don't have Spanish uh, or Galician and I was with Galicians and, and Spanish people. And, and I think just being in this beautiful, very, and it's very familiar. I'm, I'm in Dublin, Ireland, and, um, and I'm from England originally from, from the South and, and Galicia is very Celtic and it's, the countryside is very similar to Ireland and, and, and England in many ways, rolling hills, chestnuts and apple trees and, uh, you know, all, all that sort of, so very feminine, very, you know, beautiful, uh landscape and i guess and then walking doing this camino i think a lot of things come up for people i was with uh there was in fact there was a couple of people who had been abused as, as children so this was sort of something that came up and so i found as i was walking and sometimes you're walking alone sometimes you're in a group talking um that a lot of um memories came up for me and, and a lot of things about this book about blank which was this sort of experimental entirely imaginative piece but and I knew that it I think any work of the imagination you know it has something to do with your inner world but there were aspects of that which came through and which is very sort of anima based I think in many ways but the anima in about blank remains kind of distant and the moon is a huge part of the symbolism in um in about blank by the way it all kind of begins and takes off with the moon and the cat imagery which is all to do with the feminine but this, um, this piece that's in the journal, uh, which is called Log Lady, which is inspired, uh, partly inspired by David Lynch's Log Lady in um, Twin Peaks, she becomes a kind of symbol of it. But I think not having the language brought, it, the whole experience of doing the Camino, it, it brought, I thought, a sort of very feminine quality to the whole experience because it, um, it was less, like having that distance of language, having to communicate or taking longer to communicate, all those things I think kind of brought all these elements to it. And anyway, I, I'll just read a bit from it, but it was a source of, it was definitely very mythical and, um, and it felt very much kind of, you know, Dante's kind of midway through life, you know, being in the dark wood. And I guess it's, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, every, I, I can see like a trajectory with a lot of my work that would kind of go through the shadow and then more recently the anima, which is a deepening of that. And this brought about something from the work I've been doing. This piece almost feels like a concluding part or a next part to, to what a blank was, was doing in many ways, because it was a real anima um, experience. Um, Oh, and I guess something as well I should say about, so I, I was wondering as well, how would I write about this experience because it was so overwhelming and intense. And, um, and so I was conscious that I wanted to sort of capture that intensity in, in a certain way. And I, and I guess something that happens as well as with the voice because it's, it is, is that kind of relationship of the exterior of the landscape and then the interior of thoughts that all kind of swirl together. So the writing attempts to, to do that and there's no punctuate there's only the first paragraph has punctuation the rest is all no punctuation and it was so it was, I guess with any kind of poetical or, or, or literary work you're trying to find a form that fits what's going on in your head if you know what I mean um anyway I'll just read a little bit from it it's about it's a couple of pages into it page 61 um 
We must live in the world as we find it, where dark and light appear between branches. We are made young again, drawn forward to the sweet Angelus, the winging ring of bells, a call to prayer, a silent symposium, the primary imago. Birds flew from us and into us, not here, the other side, an almost lost language whispers in the listening forest. A Galician grandmother walks before you inside the trees, the wolves' eyes see through branches. I have this lost daughter, the one I never had, returns from the dead. Can we say that? Yes. What is not being said rises from the mouths of broken seeds. Two, either side of the tree, you, me, the other, all that we dreamt is in this place, nestled in the spiral arms where dark and light begin to touch, ruffling its leaves, the back of the under bus. She, I thought, she, me, I cannot, she thought, she, me, this failure to clutch and hold court is too much, I thought, she, me, the other, I cannot say what appears on the way, too little gives way without words, too much with moss covering the tongue in the sublime eloquence of the wild boar, trembling leaves and apples glutting ditches either side. Kick up the dead, too much or too on the snout, off the hoof, the whole of the rim in fact, the down and in and out of her. No, what was it then? She, I thought, she, me, I cannot, she thought, she, me, what, say it again alone with all the other shadows, crowding all about, wanting a way through me, or her at least, in the spiral arms peering down. Never so whole, never so up, never so whole, the whole of the rim of us covered in scum or moss, this failure to clutch and hold court is too much, but at least remembering the future, hardly conscious, but at least walking back past the past now, leading me through the glistening forest with bears about to pounce, wolves ready to howl, boars on the brink. Am I brave, being here where dark and light begin to touch, cleaving through the valley at last, clothed Nine, two minutes. with the must and must? Nine, two minutes. Sorry? Sorry, someone here, uh, Merle? Yes, let me just mute. Yeah, someone was unmuted by mistake. Sorry, Adam, go ahead, please. Yeah. Shall I go on? Am I brave being here where dark and light begin to touch, cleaving through the valley at last, clothed in the woodland must and moss? I have a question, two questions in fact, two questions you'll never answer. To ask is the answer, some message beyond the personal, thank God, beyond this past topic and mode of inquiry. She here now is the question, holding you the answer, passing through and around the rim of bubbles, two eyes either side. We pass through this as we pass on what we live through, so can never say that which has no words just as well between us. Now, the first day, stopping for lunch, you hand me pilgrim stick and laugh. It rings in my ears, uttering those first words, log lady. In that, a passage opens, lifting a latch to David Lynch in the afternoon lull of voices, one world to the next, the portal stick where dark and light begin to touch. Somewhere, Inside the purple patch, David Lynch to move through us, or we inside him. She, I thought, she, me, I cannot, she thought. She, me, this failure to clutch and hold court is too much, I thought. She, me, the other. I cannot say this was the way the way came between us. The forests of the future, forming universes in tangled branches, neither turning back nor looking forward to the leafy shade. A rustle runs through leaves, turning in the wind, tumbling apples strewn across the path, sloughing off a language of the past, or was it the future sluicing through us, the present more mysterious than the future, which has already happened, drawing ever nearer. My past always present, leaving me, all is fire, breath inside breath, ringing in my ears within an inch of us, where dark and light begin to touch. The way not forward, it moves side to side, back to back, the same refrain, you, who was something of the sword, cut me in half, taking me back to the tree with two questions either side, following the arrows on the narrow paths, raveling like ribbon strips, unwrapping the present, vanishing in the trees, all alone, familiar territory. Ghost hooves pound the earth on the lost highway, the highwayman behind the trees, two figures like question marks stand either side, a never ending interrogation. What about him? 
What about her, that non-closure departure? What about those splits derailing? What about these kicked up leaves, beggars, glutting ditches? What about that mother, father, having me for afters? What about mothers, fathers, the black hole? where bears and wolves roam in the hereafter, the dead leading the way in mad pursuit through the swamplands, rippling leaves, stumbling on the weeds and stones. What about that desire to return to the point of departure, to dwell in the rotten ditches of it all? What about that child here, now, falling behind, kicking up the dead? What about that ship of birth returned to source or abandoned ship, the bobbing cork on the depths? What about that sinking through circles? I am there again where cones rise into forests, pebbles burst into mountains, puddles ooze into deep lakes. Tell me now, what is that? Mother of another father, of the charming birds screaming mayhem, claiming territory, having me for lunch, the barking dogs, the mewing cats. I clutch at the rails of a fence, wince at the bite of the hounds. What about those drives home after the split, the blackening silence after screams coursed through them, death scattered on the roadside, buried under tumbling walls, cramped against me, the climbing out of the rubble, narrowing circles, all of this going back to all of that. Then, in a blue opening, between two trees, where dark and light begin to touch, a golden vision rises under an arch, nestled in the spiral arms of a whirlpool galaxy. What is this light leading me through an open gate under a chestnut, bending boughs, a rustle runs outside time, turns to me through the whispering leaves, bringing on the dark dream. In the middle of this mystery, it's all hidden. And I'll leave it there. Sorry, I hope I didn't go over time. Thank you so much, Adam. Thank you. Um, again, Adam um, submitted this piece um, later. And uh, the moment I read it, again, I felt that, no, this has to, this has to make it in this issue. Uh, I fell in love with it, uh, but reading you, I mean, hearing you read it, that's really something else. Thank you so much, Adam, for being here. We're very lucky to have you with us. We're very lucky to share your contribution. Um, Adam is a multiple award-winning playwright, author, essayist, and poet, of course. And um, he was also featured on the, the recent site creative session. So he was speaking about his Jungian approaches in writing. Uh, thank you for being here, Adam. You are a star. So and <laughs> next we move to Pamela. Pam, are you yes, there? Hello. Yeah. hello. <laughs> Pamela is joining us from Cyprus. Yes, from Nicos Nic Nicosia. And it um, it's there was snow today. Uh, so I'm I'm still quite surprised. Uh, just just to tell you that Nicosia is usually, you know, it's a Mediterranean on the Mediterranean. Uh, Cyprus is on the Mediterranean Sea. It's uh, there's a beautiful weather, and uh, we've we've been witnessing a very cold um, uh, winter. But anyways, it's it has been very uh, calming and uh, inspiring especially that um, we left Lebanon a few months ago. And uh, well, uh, and yes, inspiring in terms of uh, arts, um, art production and uh, uh, cre creativity, imagination. And uh, I'm so happy that, uh, and I was so uh, uh, glad when, uh, uh, when Rula Maria uh, told me about this issue, which I found beautiful. Um, thank you all also for your inspiring uh, and extraordinary uh, contributions. So um, my mine is uh, quite small, <laughs> just one of my uh, uh, one of my paintings uh, about the feminine um, and the need to raise uh, our own voices. Uh, so to go beyond silence um, and the short text that accompanies, uh, accompanies the, uh, I mean, the, the, the image of the painting. I don't know if you had, uh, you, you've seen it or if I can share it uh, with you. Yes, 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 Pam, please feel free to share it if you like. Yep. Okay, just a second. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is this is entitled Beyond Silence. Uh, it's just a, a, a piece of, or just a small uh, piece of a bigger, um, a bigger canvas, uh, bigger painting uh, using uh, multiple media. Um, I, in fact, it's not a new one. It's, uh, I painted it uh, uh, a few years ago, more than 10 years ago. Um, and despite, you know, uh, reform, in certain reforms, certain, uh, a few uh, new laws uh, when it comes to uh, advancing women's rights in Lebanon and the region, uh, quite frank frankly, I'm, I'm uh, still not, I'm not going to say shocked, but uh, it's quite sad to notice that uh, we still have to, I mean, our struggles um, are, are still uh, many. Uh, we have so many challenges still, so many obstacles. And uh, yes, yeah, so many women are still uh, being silenced, despite the fact that we have uh, women who are leaders, women who are creators, uh, um, women who uh, contribute uh, on an everyday basis to uh, the development of their society. So for me, uh, the feminine is, uh, I mean, is, is first about uh, having a voice um, and uh, raising one's voice uh, beyond silences. It's true that there are silences, uh, there is a different, there is a difference between different forms of silences. There are silences that are maybe they have a positive impact, but in this, um, uh, when it comes to uh, no to to uh, uh, women's rights, human rights in general, uh, we cannot uh, keep si keep silent. So um, I'm gonna just read a few lines. Um, because this, so this drawing gives voice to the often forgotten struggles for freedom and equality and portrays the experience of women in context of wars without relegating them to static pages of history where we only remember this, their status as victims. Women in this region have long been ostracized for speaking out against discrimination and abuse and silence has been a condition and consequence of being a woman, a so-called pillar of the feminine. Indeed, one of the most common misconceptions about women and the feminine in Southwestern Asia is that they are silent. In that sense, patterns of subjugation were and still are difficult to dismantle because they rely on many women's forced silence and internalization of their role as victims. True that not all silences are bad, but there is a silence that can be dangerous and that can have horrific repercussions. It is our job and our duty as educators, artists, activists, to be aware of the damaging force of silence and of the power of, voice, of voices, to stand up to abuse and injustice and to recognize the fact that rarely do we get second chances to make up for our silences. Thank you again, Rola Maria, for this um, uh, thank you. for this chance to be uh, uh, featured again in this uh, incredible um, issue. I mean, uh, in this incredible journal, uh, indelible. I wish you all the best. Um, and thank you, uh, yeah. thank you all. Thank you, and uh, thank you for reading this in your beautiful voice your beautiful, strong, powerful voice, and all what it does for so many women um, in the area, in the region. And uh, besides the fact that Dr. Pamela Shabi is an incredible activist, scholar, artist, you name it, she has it. Uh, she has done so much for women and scholars all around the region. And we are very, very lucky to have you with us here and in every issue. So. Um, uh, if you haven't seen uh, Pamela's uh, 
paintings and works. Pam, please feel free to share your website or um, Instagram page here. And I must say, nobody draws eyes like Pamela. Like <laughs> you, you can you go to that. an exhibition yeah. by Pamela and then see the same painting with different expressions and a different story behind each one. All you need to do is look at the eyes. It's incredible. Thank you so much, Pam. Um, keep shining as usual. Thank and you, Maria. And likewise, uh, so I shared my I shared my website. Uh, you can uh, access yes, thank you. Uh, samples, okay. samples of my paintings on it and the Instagram. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, next up is Sam. All right. Thank you for having me, Rula Maria. It's really a, it was an unexpected pleasure to have you say yes. Love to put it in here and um, looking forward to sharing. This was out of a Jungian arts-based research project for a class of mine, because I'm a student at uh, Pacifica Graduate Institute in California, but right now I'm in Nepal. So yeah, it was, I titled it, um, it's a short piece of fiction called Kali Yuga. And for those who don't know, Kali Yuga, different than Kali as like this destructive feminine force, Kali Yuga is considered the end of days equivalent in uh, Hindu mythology. And so this story is sort of two voices in my own mind trying to come to some wholeness surrounding uh, the perceived threat of climate change, fear, tumult, these themes. And so they're just walking in Prospect Park in Brooklyn where I was living. And that's where this takes place. Um, yeah, I'll, I could say a little more, but um, sort of just musing on the passage of time and uh, the sort of circling of the lake itself as the symbol of sort of this maternal ocean out of which we all came into which things may go again. And uh, yes, anyway, I'll just read a little bit here. Okay, not all of it. Do you know about Hindu cosmology? Came Amelia's sudden reply. Here she goes again with her Indian mythology, thought Paul. Always Veda's this or Upanishad's that. Where does she get this from? She would say a past life, no doubt, and isn't that a fine argument? Even so, a smile spread on his lips, warmed by the infectious touch of Amelia's passion. Tell me about Hindu cosmology. Well, drawing a deep breath, they believe there are four ages. I won't bother telling you their Sanskrit names, but they begin with the longest and purest, where people are righteous and everything is in order. The following ages are shorter and colored by less righteousness, more corruption, until the final Kali Yuga, when, as Hamlet says, the time is out of joint. The Kali Yuga is when everything is flipped, castes intermarry, rivers are on fire, and it is no longer possible to attain enlightenment. They rounded a bend along the lake where old men idled with fishing rods and children came to marvel at the turtles floating lazily their heads poking white rings in the surface of the inky green water. When at last the sands of time run out, their myth says, Lord Vishnu will appear on a white horse and wipe out the sinners and demons, leaving the last few virtuous people to rebuild humanity. And the process begins again. All four ages combine into one kalpa, which is but a day in Lord Brahma's life, or a blink of his eye, actually. Her illustration reminded Paul of some infinite regression of mirrors cycling through dimensions, outer into inner into outer endlessly, very psychedelic. But what I find so interesting about this idea, she continued, is that according to their calendars, we have been in the Kali Yuga since about 3000 BC. It's like their version of being cast out of the Garden of Eden, like we're doomed to be born in a sinful world so far from truth and goodness like everyone imagines things were better before their time. I wonder if whoever came up with that was just having a really shitty day, joked Paul, inwardly admiring her wise perspective. Amelia was lost in thought and didn't hear him. In the reflection of her eyes, birds were suspended in midair. 
It's like we're so beautiful and perfect in this moment, right now. Her voice had trailed into a whisper. Reaching the far side of the lake, they unconsciously moved toward their favorite bench, even though they knew they couldn't sit there today. The most recent storm had made the lake overflow for the first time in their memory. A myriad of diamonds sparkled from the sun-flecked water, ducks traced a shimmering wake above the sunken footpath, and a beer bottle bobbed right side up, caressed by the warm breeze. He hadn't felt the breeze before, but now it fluttered curtains around his eyes and thawed frosty rooms in his mind. A vision emerged from the water. It was Amelia approaching on a white horse. At the edge of the dry pavement, their fingers found each other intertwined and a secret was vouchsafed them. So that's the end of the story. Thank um, you so much, Sam, for this captivating story. I especially like the part when Amelia appears on the white horse. Um, yeah, there's just so much, so, so much neat archetypal reflections released there. Uh, and thank you for sharing it with Indelible. So we'll look forward to receiving more of your work in the future as well. All right. Sounds good. Well, thanks for having me again. And thanks for everyone for listening and sharing your extraordinary art. It's, it's really inspiring. Thank you. And so are you, Sam. Thank you very much. And um, next, Almond. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, first, thanks to Rilla. Um, this, uh, uh, in October 2020, a friend of mine who's a much better novelist and poet and so on sent me her book, Carbon Song of Crafts. So it's a verse novel set in Ukraine, Soviet and post-Soviet Ukraine. And I, uh, I promised her I'd write a review of it because I reviewed two of her previous books, um, which were novels, Damn Duchess and Zap. And it's a wonderful, wonderful, uh, very rich and at times dense work, but also really moving. And I wrote the article when she sent me the, the PDF of the book in October or November. I wrote it in December about a year and a half ago, a year and four months ago. And I wanted to place it with um, Indelible if I, I tried to, but Rula said she was going to wait till the feminine issue to, to, to put it in. And, and, I, and it, I'm so glad it's there now because I think it suits the issue perfectly. Um, it's uh, a verse novel set in Soviet and post-Soviet Ukraine, and I'm going to read a few passages from the middle of my essay presently, which will just give you an idea of how I got to know her and a bit of the kind of the sen sensibility behind the work, which was what I was trying to do with this essay, which was kind of outline the, um, the kind of, um, I suppose, scurrilous and reflexive sensibility at work in the poetry. And... Um, also obviously very topical with Ukraine now because we everyone knows what's going on in Ukraine. So yeah, that was tragically timely. My sister wrote to me when I shared the essay with her, my sister wrote to me a few days ago and said, when do you write this? I told her I wrote it a year ago and she said, oh my God, that's so weird because you know, no, who, who knew? Or maybe people who are much more politically astute knew this was gonna happen, but I didn't. So it's a nice, um, it's not nice, it's a very tragic, just bad coincidence or synchronicity, but uh, it happened. So I'm going to read a few passages from the near the middle of the essay, if I may. The, the essay is titled Inky Dense. Can you see me, everyone? I've just moved to my screen, um, separate screen of the tab of the essay. Can, can I, am I still being seen and heard? Yeah, right. we can see you, but you're oh, not good. sharing the screen, are you? No, you no, that's see. fine. I need to share. Okay. Yeah, yeah to we share. can see you. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to read from the middle of the essay. Um, and I'll read a few paragraphs. So... I first came to know of Svetlana Lavochkina a few years ago, when the opening part of the work to be discussed in this article, although it's more like an essay actually, was published, if perhaps not fully in the present, book, present book's finished form, in the Routler's Journal Poem, edited by Professor Fiona Sampson, where I was actually at the same time published in the same issue, so that's how I got to know her. Then we began exchanging emails and became kind of um, literary friends remotely, though we've never met in person. Uh, Ukrainian-born, Lavochkina is a polyglot poet and novelist of immense flair, of sheer luxuriating pizzazz. Her writing in both genres, novels and poetry, is fantastic, and though she writes in original English, her English and her English use is precious to her, not in the sense of, you know, affected, but in the sense of someone treasuring a tongue that it was possible they might never have known, or at least might never have possessed, 
was such inhabiting dexterity. The contingent happening of her having mastered English is a made a necessary event for her life and work. You know, she really does um, use English obviously with immense flair, but you can tell not because of any lack of fluency, but because of the richness. It's like someone's using a language that they revel in because it wasn't a given that they would have that language. So it's wonderful to read her work. Um, since becoming remotely acquainted with Lovotchkina, I had the opportunity to review two of her works, Zap and Dame Duchess. So I can say that this last book, Carve and Song of Crafts, well, um, you know, it's, it's, it's the same author through and through. She's got the same way of telling a story and weaving events and language together. Um, the novels, along with this new verse novel, or relatively new verse novel, all affect character with the same satirical hyperbolic animus. Animus being probably an, a wrong word to use in an issue about the anima and the feminine, but it works kind of in a, in a kind of uh, uh, inverted way. Um, the scheme of interwoven lives can seem at times perhaps slightly too serendipitous, but that impression about the book only lasts for as long as you haven't realized that that very scheme is not realistically interwoven, but hyper-realistically hyper in the process for the reader of its interweaving. Which is to say, to my mind, Lovotchkina's fictions are less like, less like attempts to represent living experience with distanced realism, as in for a Russian compatriot, sorry, not, sorry, a Russian speaking compatriot, she speaks Russian, of course, being Ukrainian born, Tolstoy, and more like the machinations of a chess game, where once you've accepted the game's parameters, the riotous fun begins. Uh, this is certainly not to say that in Carbon, as elsewhere, Lavochkina is not true to life. Many of her characters are indeed far more complex than mere pawns. In fact, some of them seem so to be so layered and deep that they're too much so, which is another way of saying what I mean here. The reality Lavochkina wishes to reach and represent by her individual manner of storytelling is, it seems, of a higher order of abstraction. Some of the happenings in her fiction here as elsewhere we might not imagine happened to us, but typifying a reflexive satirical mindset the exaggerations in whatever direction are there to paint our reality with real or perhaps more symbolically pertaining truths. Perversity serves the norm. Out of the stark black and white of satire, the alpha omega, we gain insight with visual force into the many shades between. So that's just, I mean, I start in this essay, I write about um, her, her, basically the, the kind of book it is, generically, as well as um, the plot, as well as um, Kind of the various ways in which language and desire or language and sex are very Freudian, Lacanian kind of connexus, maybe not Jung, not so much Jungian at least, uh, are connected. Um, and um, I'm, I was very pleased to have it published. I mean, that, that last sentence I read about perversity serving the norm, I really believe that. I believe that, you know, I once was teaching a student or tutoring a student in some psychology, although I'm not a psychology major, but I knew what he was what he was studying. And I gave him the example of this. When Freud um, you know, writes his early essays, he always starts with the perversions before he gets to the norm. And I think and the analogy I made to him, that student, was like at the time it was Trump. Trump was like the perversion that actually lights up the whole nature of the system as it's been, the, as it's been in the US for, for whatever, 50, 60 years. So that it takes the kind of, um, the kind of exaggerated exception to show you the, the real nature of what's going on and the, and the normal shades in between. So that's why this book, one of the main, main reasons why this book that I wrote an essay about is, is, is very, very, very worthy and valid of being read and enjoyed. And again, as I say at the end of the essay, anyone who loves the language, um, you know, um, will really, really be thrilled with this, this book um, because it really is um, a kind of, carnival of language and happenings as well but really really good book so that's just me that's me done sorry if i was a bit i uh, rushed it a little bit but um very pleased to have placed it in this issue of indelible thank you rilla and um yeah so if anyone was interested to read it um i hope it will lead you to the book itself which is published i think by lost horse press but under the auspices of university of washington press not directly university of washington press that's me, guys. Thanks very much for the opportunity. Thanks, Rilla. Um, great to be so a part much, of this. Thank you so much, Alma. Thank you for, um, we really appreciate your review because um, many of you who know Alma know how much his opinion counts. Uh, if Alma likes something and recommends something, then it must be really, really good. 
So thank you for sharing this with us. And you may also like to use the space, Alma, to, um, to write your the, the link to your website or to your books. Uh, Alma, uh, uh, many of you know, is a great poet, uh, award-winning, wonderful poet. So please use the space to um, do a little bit of um, self-advertising if you want. Well, I'm not, I don't have, a, my website's like a three years old, but I mean, my latest book is Morning Lit Portals After Alia. It's a book about family relationships, mainly in my daughter. It was actually reviewed, thankfully, in Indelible as well. So there's anyone who's caught on to that. You know, that's my latest book. Um, and I'm working on a, on a Lebanese verse novel, um, which should come out in 2022, The Cedar Never Dies. And uh, yeah, and um, well, I was one more thing I wanted to say, um, but it's gone out of my mind. I'm sorry. So anyone interested in, in my poetry, the, the, the decent book is the latest one. All the others are crap. Um, <laughs> everyone said, I think all, all writers say that. Uh, morning lit portals after era. Thanks. Thanks, Rilla. Thank you, Ahmad. We love your work. We love your poetry. And we think it's all great. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, that's what I was going to say. Sorry. One more thing. Sorry, Rilla. Go ahead. Um, that I, I, I rarely write any write on any book that I enjoy. So um, I don't think I've ever written a really scathing review or essay review. So um, it's not that the work is always good. It's that uh, I only review good books, the ones I enjoy. So I, uh, you know, that was just a, a caveat there. Because mm -hmm. I don't like, I don't, I don't believe in writing a review about something that you're going to spend the whole 10 pages or two pages kind of picking apart because I think it's mean and pointless in the end. So I only write about good books and this is one of them. Thanks guys, sorry, sorry Willa. Thank you, thank you Omar, no worries. Um, okay, so we're gonna use the rest of the space uh, for some discussions and commenting. If you would like to, to comment on anyone's work, ask somebody a question, feel free to do so. Before that, we're gonna do a very important reveal right now. So uh, I mentioned earlier that we will be having the Indelible Festival of Literature 2022 from the 28th of March to April 15. And uh, I'm very happy to say that the promotional material is almost there, almost because it runs tomorrow. So I'm gonna share my screen and um, just show you what to expect on the Indelible website. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, so for spreading the word and for seeing the schedule, the Zoom links are not there yet, but they will be out tomorrow. Um, just go to News and Events, Indelible Festival of Literature 2022. As you can see, it's still in edit mode. This is why you can't see it, but uh, unless I share it. So, uh, week one, we start with Naomi Shihab Nye on the 28th of March. Uh, the timing is still set in Dubai time. So again, we'll be we'll be fixing that in a bit. Uh, and then we have Andre Nafis Sahili on March 29th. He will be reading from his new book, his forthcoming book, The Promised Land, Poems from Itinerant Life. And then we have um, screenwriter and novelist Raymond Khoury, who will be joining us on the 30th of March. And he will be speaking about the difference between writing for the screen and writing for novels, since he does both. And then we have Maria Taylor, who will be speaking about identity, layering identity, um, poet and critic Maria Taylor. Then on Friday, April 1st, we have an interesting interdisciplinary panel called Poetry Across the Disciplines. And this will feature um, poet scientist Chun Yu, uh, Fiona Sampson, who is also a musician, and uh, doctors uh, Fuad Fuad and uh, Norbert Hirschhorn, who are also poets, and Alain Demetriadis, who comes from a, a psychotherapy uh, background as well. And Monday, April 4th, really interesting panel on ecopoetics, featuring both Ruth Padel and Abhay K who will speak about the fragile earth and the role of poetry in expressing that. And then uh, for writers who are interested in working on their profile, we will be featuring Antonia Taylor, who will speak about how to build your author brand. Uh, Antonia Taylor is a poet, um, and she's also a creative business communications expert. And 
And uh, we have Romalin Anti, who will be joining us on April 6th. Uh, Romalin, for those of you who looked at the issue, uh, she is the poet whose interview is featured. Uh, Romalin is also a nurse and an award-winning poet. And Thursday, April 7th, we have Anthony Anaxagoro, who will be talking about his forthcoming work, Heritage Aesthetics. And then uh, Friday, April 8th, we have two sessions. We have one during the day here in Dubai. That will be 1 p.m. in Dubai. We have Zach Zakar, who will be joining us from Australia. Uh, Zach is a Montessori trainer and storyteller, and she will be speaking about the importance of storytelling in, in educating uh, young children. Then we have Sabrina Mahfouz, who will be joining us on April 11th. Uh, many of you probably have heard of Sabrina Mahfouz, writer, spoken word poet, playwright, radio presenter, um, and she will be speaking about her new forthcoming book. Um, and of course, the the background behind it, the historic background, uh, the British Empire, the Middle East, and the bodies of water. And then Tuesday, uh, Adam and I will be speaking about depth poetry and alchemical poetics. So for those of you interested in Jungian stuff, you might like to attend our session. And Wednesday, um, poet and lawyer Mona Arshi will be speaking about her novels, uh, her novel actually, her recent novel and her poetry. And uh, Thursday, April 14th, we'll be hosting Patricia Finney and Sarah Smith, both who write novels set in Elizabethan times, thrillers and dramas and others. Um, so they will be in conversation with uh, Shakespearean scholar Dr. Alan Hickman uh, about modern adaptations of Shakespeare. And finally, we will have uh, the grand finale will be an editor's chat. So this will be featuring uh, Roizen. Hello, Roizen, who's with us today, uh, who's the editor of Crow of Minerva, Kostya Tsolakis, who is the editor of Harana Poetry, Andre uh, Nafis Sahili, who is the editor of Poetry London, and yours truly here, who is the editor of Indelible. We hope to see everyone. And um, that's the poster that you will be seeing soon. So please share, share, share. Uh, we'll be sending you this on email. Uh, follow us on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter, and please share, please spread the word. Um, this is a wonderful event. These are some amazing writers and uh, we would like to see a great turnout. We know people really appreciate these events, especially that they're free, they're online. You can attend from the comfort of your own home or car or office or what have you. Um, and Pamela, you would probably like to speak about your forthcoming conference. Yes, uh, please. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen again. Um, there uh, we are organizing, uh, I mean, I'm organizing uh, uh, under, uh, I mean, with the, the Dar es Salaam University in Bethlehem, Palestine. Um, the 20, their 24th uh, conference, international conference, and this time it would be focusing on culture, culture and digital transformation, so the relation between the two. Uh, and uh, uh, well, it's, uh, uh, but it has to, to, to deal with uh, uh, Southwest Asia and North Africa, so challenges and opportunities for this region. And it will take place on June 10, 11 in Cyprus. The venue is still to be confirmed. For those of you who are, who are interested in participating in this conference, um, well, uh, you can still uh, submit uh, your abstract uh, or uh, a description of a talk. So it's either in a form of a, uh, uh, an academic paper or a talk. Um, and the uh, deadline is uh, March 19. So in a few days from now, you just go to uh, darelkalima.edu.ps. Uh, which you can see here on the screen, and you will easily find uh, on the home page. You will easily find the banner of the conference, um, either in English or in Arabic. And uh, well, so uh, looking forward to uh, 
uh, you know, receiving uh, maybe a few forms. Uh, uh, and uh, yes, uh, you, you, I mean, those who are interested in the subject and who have something to say about it, uh, so please do. Uh, thank you, Hula Maria. And if you need further you, information, you can always contact me. So there's no problem. Thank you so much, Pamela. This is a, a wonderful, wonderful topic. And uh, maybe you would like to, did you share the website already in the chat box? Maybe you would like to do that just in case. And uh, again, please drop Pamela a line if you are interested. And uh, Pam, um, the presenters, uh, the, their tickets to Cyprus that will also be covered by the conference organizers as well. Yes, yes, selected okay. participants will. Okay. I mean, all uh, all travel uh, expenses will be covered. Uh, uh -huh. Accommodation, uh, the ticket, uh, transportation, meals, everything, which are, which has become a rare thing nowadays. So, <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pam. So Pamela will be there. I will be there. And we hope to see some of you there as well. Uh, thank you so much for sharing this. And um, OK, so the floor is open now for some conversation. We still have around 15 minutes left. So would anyone like to say something or add something? Any questions? All right, I'll start with a question. Uh, it may sound like a dumb question, but I'm really curious to know, Rami, how much do these equipment, how much does it cost? Uh, well, currently my uh, overall investment in this hobby is between 15 and $20,000. Wow. But, but you do not need that much money to uh, to get into to get into it. Uh, I, I do it because uh, I've been investing in it for about seven years, so it's, a, it's an accumulative of seven years. However, uh, if you're if you're making money from it, you would make that money and more. Um, I made I, I make um, I doesn't I, I don't make money from this. Um, you know as as a profession, I, I will monetize it at some point. Uh, but you really, if you want to, if you want to get a telescope and look at the moon and Saturn, um, you can get something for 250 to $300 and uh, you'll be able to see whatever you want. Um, if you want any recommendations, uh, reach out to me on Instagram. I see all the, uh, all the messages. So um, even with, with my following, I'll get you something uh, that that suits you. And I also have a list of recommendations on my Instagram and the highlights if you check that out. Yep. Well, oh, thank you. Thank you, Rami. Um, see, I try taking photos with my iPhone and it's it's pathetic. So yeah, if, <laughs> if, if, you get, if you get if you get if you get a hundred a hundred dollar telescope and you mount your cell phone to it you'll be able to take a good picture. The main thing is the lens, you know, it's not the camera. Hi, okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's good to note then. Thank you, thank you, Rami. You're welcome. Uh, Rami, I believe you're joining us from Virginia, right? Correct, correct, yeah. yes. Sarah, you too. She Sarah, told did you me. have a problem with it? Oh, okay. Oh, you know yeah, each Sarah. other. We just uh, the privately chatted. She's in Fredericksburg, about 45 minutes away. She works in Richmond, too. Wow, so, okay. Yeah, it, it's an coincidence. coincidence. Uh huh. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> just down the road. Yeah. Yeah. So it was a nice um, juxtaposition here. You know, there were there were lots of stories and poems that featured the moon in this issue. I just thought we needed to have some great lunar photography, and I'm glad we did. 
Yeah, uh, you know, I, I really, uh, it was nice to meet everyone. You know, it, it was a very uh, pleasant experience to me and great, great work, you know, the, the, your taste and, and how you assembled the issue together with the photography. It, it, it's a, it's a, you know, gave it a great flavor and it, it's very aesthetic. So congratulations. Thank you, thank you, Rami. See, um, we always get some great art at the last minute and it just, you know, that's, that's usually when the on button is switched here in my brain. I'm like, okay, I need to contact this artist. I need to contact this photographer. And uh, usually it's the ones I really hesitate to contact because I would think that you wouldn't answer. Uh, what happened with uh, Tomoko, Tomoko Nagao as well, um, I have her Birth of Venus like right in front of me. It's a small postcard that I bought from the Victoria and Albert Museum many years ago, I think six or seven years ago. Um, we were at the museum and there was an exhibition for her work. And my daughter who was three at the time uh, wanted to take the painting back home and threw a tantrum there, you know, I want the Hello Kitty painting. She thought it was a Hello Kitty painting. She probably saw it somewhere there. Um, and then, you know, by the time we made it to the, to the shop, to the, to the gift shop, and we found that poster, we were able to calm her down with it. But I loved it so much, and I just hung it in front of me uh, on the wall. So I'm looking at it every day. And then just a few days before, I thought, you know what, it would be just amazing if we could have her art too. So I contacted her as well, and uh, well, we were lucky we were lucky to have this, um, this gorgeous cover. I mean, all the art is gorgeous. Um, it's just that there are some surprises that happen at the last minute. Maybe that's something I should share during the editor's chat, you know? Mm -hmm. Not everything is planned, sort of, you know, some things happen as you go along, as the issue finishes. Mm -hmm. So for example, Adam's submission also came uh, towards the end as well. Great. Yeah. Yeah, just one uh, one tip. Uh, don't don't be intimidated by by uh, by artists who have a lot of followers, millions of followers. They uh, if they don't check, they would have someone who checks. And if and uh, you know, media and magazines are a priority. So we always we're looking for uh, messages from um, from media and magazines. So chances that they will get back to you are very high. So I would just keep trying. Thanks for the tip. Yeah. We will, let's see who, who's, uh, who will be the surprise for the next issue. And Sarah also has a beautiful submission um, for this issue as well, but she presented it last time during the site creative session. But I wonder Sarah, if you might wanna share a little bit more, uh, maybe just give a little glimpse on that. Oh, sure. she's got some, some great art as well and poetry. Yeah, um, I I didn't prepare anything. <laughs> okay, you could just you know just briefly uh, speak about your contributions to the journal. Well, I did. Um, I submitted a. Um, essay that I had written about a really personal experience with when my mother um, fell into a coma after a brain aneurysm and sort of the whole process that that sent me through that was um, it was a time of sort of waiting and reevaluating and seeing who she would become and during that time we have uh, really dear friends around us who um, were all uh, really interested in working dreams, which is my background. I'm, I, I heard Sam say he is at Pacifica. I graduated from Pacifica three years ago, and this experience really led into my dissertation work in, in a really roundabout way. But um, when she was in the coma. I really relied on my dreams. And so there's quite a number of dreams in the piece. And I often draw my dreams too. So there's one of one of them is an illustration of a dream image um, that was that came to me during that time of um, 
she's sort of a Virgin Mary type figure. Um, and all of that that's that's not in the article is that um, that time of sort of waiting and sitting and that not knowing connected me really deeply to the experience that our world is going through on so many different levels, but particular for, particularly for me with the issue of climate change. And that's what my um, dissertation turned into was really an evaluation of climate change through a depth psychological perspective and that idea of sitting and waiting and the reverie that comes from that time. And um, so that was, that's a little extra piece on that. But yeah, I read it in the last site creative. And I also submitted a pen tune poem. And that was inspired by a, um, a mandala drawing that I had done. Um, and that process, I, I created the mandala, which if anybody is, likes to draw, if you just do draw a circle, and then just sort of take it as a really meditative time and draw a few lines here and there, and then just see what comes out of it. And that's how I did this mandala. And it turned into this sort of really feminine figure. And uh, and that inspired the, the poem that came out of it later. So. And it was very beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, Gottfried um, also presented some of his, um, his poetry um, on Friday, uh, but Gottfried also has some beautiful photography and some brilliant art in this issue as well. And uh, I wanna thank you, Gottfried, for always contributing with some great work. Thank Thanks. you so much for accepting it and publishing it. It's, it's absolutely you. wonderful. It's an honor. Thank you so much. Honor. Thank you. So um, I hope we all meet again uh, during the Festival of Literature. Again, I'll be sending you the, uh, the schedule link and uh, hopefully we'll have the Zoom links out by tomorrow. And uh, yeah, I mean, be there, bring friends. I know the timing could be a little tricky for some of you because um, it's 7 p.m. here. So that would be um, 11 EST now. Yeah, it would be 11 EST. So um, those joining from California, I think it would be pretty tough because it's really early in the morning. Um, <laughs> sorry, Vinny, but unless you're awake that early, I mean, it would be, it would be wonderful to have you join us as well. And uh, thank you all again for a wonderful, wonderful issue. Uh, I look forward to, um, I mean, I'm following everyone. I chased you down on Instagram and Facebook, and now I can be in touch with your work um, more frequently. Uh, again, please follow us back, follow Indelible, and um, check out some of our forthcoming events. Um, the theme for our next issue will be out after the festival, so at some point in April, during mid-April. All right, so everyone have a great day and uh, good night. Yes, Gottfried. Sorry, just, just uh, you mentioned, I think the 30th of April is the next. Yes, uh, and, and uh, what, next site creative. Yes, the next and, site creative. Yes, and yeah. who, who, is, who is that going to be? Susan Rowland. She will be oh, speaking yeah, yeah. about her latest work, The Sacred Well Murders, uh, arts based research, and her novel writing. So it will be the brilliant Susan next and of course uh we will be sharing this right after the festival thank you thank you all have a great day night blessings take care bye-bye thank, thank you thank you bye everybody bye, everyone thanks Rula. bye, bye. Thanks, thank you all. Bye.